Clark. I am better known as Clarko. Um, and as we just heard, I am at Black Pixel. Prior to that, I was at Square, and prior to that, I was at Black Pixel. Today we're talking about uh, typography and computers. Um, typography is kind of an interesting art because it's hundreds of years old, but the thing that we do, do on computers is like a rough approximation that's actually kind of terrible. But the history of it is so rich and the lore of it is so uh, interesting that you can really express a lot of emotion and get a lot of nuance out of typography that uh, as far as the last three decades go, we went from type being chunks of metal that you bought from a shop and you laid out on the table and you inked them and pressed paper on them and that was how you printed pages to desktop publishing. And desktop publishing digitized those chunks of metal so that if you have a sufficiently large collection of these uh, of fonts, then you can reproduce things in high fidelity and this is revolutionary for the, uh, for the graphic design industry, but for digital designers, it was not that helpful. Uh, if you're making applications in the 80s or if you're making web pages in the 80s, 90s, and beyond, you were kind of stuck with a very shoddy approximation of, of typography. Because type in fonts is a collection of vector shapes. It's just a series of outlines approximating the, the shape of the letters that the designer intended. When you display it on a screen, you're just filling these outlines with pixels, and pixels are square. So at any particular time, some of these, uh, these are four fonts that uh, if you're a digital designer, you could become very familiar with because during the 90s, these were like the only four fonts you could rely on, these in Times New Roman. The top one is Arial, then Helvetica, then uh, we have Trebuchet MS and Verdana. And three of those four were commissioned by Microsoft to be built for the web for low resolution devices. So even though they all look very similar, they all belong to the same rough class of sans serif fonts, um, they do have their nuances. Uh, famously, Arial at the top is derived from Helvetica immediately under it. They are, for all intents and purposes, identical except for some things around the foot on the A, you can see the top of the T on Arial is angled, whereas all of the terminals on Helvetica are horizontal or perfectly vertical. Um, you can see a lot of some subtle differences in the E's uh, among all the words and the F's. But when you put all these things on the screen and you're just trying to fill these, these curves with square pixels, you lose a lot of detail. The best thing we have today, being the retina display, does a pretty decent job of it. You can still see in Arial, for instance, that the top of the T is angled. And this is because we're looking at 326 pixels per inch. Now this, this uh, is roughly what a retina display looks like at one eighth of an inch tall. So if you open up your contacts app on your iPhone and you look through your contacts who, whose names are all beautiful, uh, the second one there, Helvetica at one eighth of an inch tall is that. And on the phone, that is size 17, 17 points. Um, but pixels are not actually a unit of measure. And back before the retina display, we would say that that was 17 pixel font. But since we now have retina and we see uh, pixels not as a physical measurement, but more of a logical measurement, we call it points. And so pre-retina displays, half as many pixels, but exactly the same size, one eighth of an inch. And because it's half the resolution, 163 pixels per inch, it just looks way crummier. The top of the T, as my example for, uh, for Arial, isn't pointy anymore. You just lose all of the detail. And for the most part, unless you have a really discerning eye and if you're really snobby, you're, you're no longer able to tell the difference between Helvetica and Arial, for instance. And really, all of them may as well be the same font, with the possible exception that Verdana is way bigger, which at small type sizes is very useful for readability, but it just feels like, it feels like a bigger font actually because the lowercase letters are all way bigger relative to the uppercase letters than most other fonts. But if we keep going back in time, uh, this is, you know, this is the iPad mini today and it's the iPhone 3GS of only a few years ago. If you go back in time another 10 years, 
this is a 96 pixels per inch display. I had a, a 13 inch uh, CRT display on one of my first Windows PCs that looked exactly like this. And for all intents and purposes, this looks like shit. <laughs> but this was the reality of our day-to-day -day lives. And in those days, one eighth of an inch was like maybe as small as you could practically make text in your uh, Word document or on the web. And at least with desktop publishing, you knew that the output was print. You knew that the eventual uh, display would be high resolution. But when you're working natively on the web, and these are the best you can do, it's uh, it's sad. Um, and then, of course, all this gray stuff, um, if you've never heard of anti-aliasing before, because we're trying to fill those subtle strokes with square pixels, any time that there is like one and a half pixels worth of stroke, they would try and fill it with a a gray or a semi-transparent pixel to approximate the half pixel and your quarter pixels. So it's it's very blurry and kind of grungy, but if you squint and if the type is far enough away and small enough, it looks at least a little more natural because before we had anti-aliasing, we had this. If you can fit the pixel in the stroke, it exists. If you can't, it's gone. And thankfully, I mean, Helvetica turns out horribly in this mode. Uh, the other fonts, which Microsoft commissions specifically for low-resolution devices, and they were never really intended for print output, unlike Helvetica, which was always intended for print output, um, they made specially hinted bitmap versions of these fonts, which is why the first, third, and fourth font actually look readable when you pull it down and turn off anti-aliasing. Of course, one-eighth of an inch is still fairly generous sizing. If you go to one-sixteenth of an inch, um, I don't know if you can see this, but it says resolutionary. And 1 16th of an inch, if you pull out your phone, is the size of the time in your status bar. It's very small text. And if you tried to pull this off, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you would have completely unreadable text. Um, it actually gets worse when you turn on anti-aliasing, which is why um, for type sizes below, like, 8 uh, in on old devices and at 1 16th of an inch, this is size 8, I believe, of this font um, on a 96-point display. This is all, you know, because pixels aren't a unit of measure, they're completely relative and they're just totally ephemeral. Saying type sizes is almost pointless, which is why I'll stick to physical measurements. 1 16th of an inch on a 96-point uh, pixel per inch display is just chunky. As you start stepping forward into modern technology, this is the iPad mini at 163 points per inch, you can actually start to see some of the detail. This is actually worth looking at. And when you get to Retina, you can actually see that this is all the same typeface. These are just different weights of the same typeface. So 10 years ago, there was no point in using anything except two weights, just regular and bold. Because regular was maybe one pixel wide, and bold was maybe two. But now, at 1 16th of an inch, at, title bar, at uh, status bar size, you can discern these seven different weights with the naked eye and actually appreciate that there is some subtle difference. And so we've kind of hit this point in display technology where it's worth giving a damn about type. Prior to that, the only people who really cared about type were print designers because they had the perfect output for type. But the displays have finally gotten to the point where we should pay attention and can. And I should point out, when you worked on the web uh, for all those years, you had like seven typefaces that you could work with. If you work on iOS, there are 60 built into iOS 6. You can cut out half of those for non-English scripts. Um, so if you wanted to do something really unique, something particular to your brand, uh, if you do it in print, that's great. You just go and buy a font, and you have a license to reproduce that in print. On the web, that has only recently turned around with web fonts, and they, they do special mangling so that you're not actually serving a copy of the font that people can then take and use for themselves. But for apps, this is only really, really recently turned around. Licensing for fonts has always been very weird because uh, font foundries, the people who design and sell these things, these are 100-year-old companies. They're slow moving, and they're very paranoid about losing their intellectual property. They used to sell you a slab of metal. And when you pr uh, pressed on the type, you were producing a print of that metal, but you were not redistributing the means to make more posters. You the metal stayed unique. And when they started licensing digital typography in the 80s, they went to extreme lengths 
the same kind of lengths we see today in the music in the music and movie industry to protect their intellectual property. They've slowly loosened that up uh, because they know that for the most part, people aren't going to take a copy of the font, and there's no copy embedded in your poster. There's no copy embedded in your website. But for apps, the copy of the font is literally inside the app bundle. The the Cocoa Frameworks, when you reference a, a font that is not part of the phone, you have to put it inside the app bundle. And if you sync that to your, your computer, then you can just open that up and take the font. And so they're understandably very paranoid about all this. And they didn't want to sell custom fonts for the longest time. And they didn't want you to embed them because you're effectively redistributing them. But they've come around. Um, those three different companies there, they're aggregators of people's fonts. And they have specific app licensing terms, which was unheard of uh, even two years ago. And it's still not that many fonts. And it's still very expensive. You pay between $200 and $2,000 per year for the privilege of embedding somebody else's font in your application. Um, so for the most part, unless it really matters to you, you'll probably end up steering away from it because of the cost. But there are a bunch of other benefits. And particularly if this is relevant to your brand, and particularly if it's not listed on one of these pages, you can always just call the foundries. They are staffed by real people. These people do want to make money. And really, all you're doing is negotiating the terms under which you won't get sued for redistributing their font. <laughs> they know that the font has to go in the app. And they know, for the most part, that when people buy an app, they don't actually take the app binary to their computer, unzip it, and pull out the font and use it. They know that like nobody even syncs their phones. So they're, they're cool about it, but you might be able to talk them down to like 600 bucks for a font per year. Um, I've worked in places where we've done this a couple times. It's, um, it's usually not worth it, because for the most part, you have this situation where all apps use the same fonts. And if you deviate from that, you want it to be for a very good reason. You want to stand out for a particular reason. And we'll get to those a bit later. But it's worth talking to these people, because they are just businesses run by human beings. There are obvious downsides to this perfect storm. Um, custom fonts, or even, you know, there are fonts that you can download and embed in your application, and those are fully custom. Those are outside of the scope of the operating system. But even inside the operating system, where you have 60 fonts at your disposal, deviating from Helvetica has its downsides. The first of which is Russian, Tamil, Thai. Anything that is non-English, as soon as you type a character in your fancy font that's not an English font, that doesn't, uh, not an English character that doesn't belong to that font, it'll get substituted with the system font. There's only one Thai font on the entire phone. And so if you have a game, for instance, and it's a Western game, and you have a nice Western font that looks like a wanted poster, and then you have your top, uh, top scores table, all the people with English names will use that font that you chose. Anyone with a uh, name that is in a different script, whether it's a Cyrillic script, whether it's Thai, uh, it'll just get swapped out. And you have no control over that there are no fonts that are all-encompassing. There are thousands and thousands of glyphs in the world, thousands and thousands of individual characters, and no font maker is that exhaustive in their work. At the most common fonts you'll get, they'll have the Latin set, all the English letters, all the accented versions of the English letters, and a few like Greek niceties thrown in for fun. But you have to watch out for this, especially if you're doing a publication, uh, for instance, uh, an e-reader or a magazine where you're going to feature people's names, because one Swedish person coming in could ruin everything for you. <laughs> Another downside is pattern matching. Human beings are excellent at seeing patterns in the world and, for no reason, attaching meaning to those patterns. When we see things and you make up a pattern, you think th that there is some kind of precedent for it. You start attaching cliches to it. For even though you might not attach significance to a particular font, People in the world can and will and do. For instance, if you wanted to make something really uh, handmade looking, you're an app that you felt uh, deserved some handcrafting or looking like it was uh, drawn on a piece of paper, be aware that most people are exposed to uh, you know, hand-drawn block letters on indie movies about teenagers, uh, usually starring Michael Sarah. 
And so what you think is nice and handcrafted and personalized, they might think is juvenile and talks to kind of quietly. So if you want to go for something bolder, there's uh, Gotham. Gotham is usually popular right now for movie posters. It's uh, just kind of trying to take the lead on that. Um, it's a very strong font. I like the hell out of it, but uh, for the most part, out in the world, it's tense, edgy films where someone is going to get their ass kicked. And Trajan, Trajan is kind of like, uh, prior to Gotham, Trajan was king of the movie poster fonts. It's in hundreds of movie posters. But for the most part, they are all epic tales of adventure. And so what you might think is a nice reference to the Roman columns, like literally this font is based on the, the, uh, on the type that you see carved into walls and columns all around Rome. Um, for the most part, they will think it's you know, kind of a Disney adventure. But you can buck these trends, and, but you have to do so knowingly. So the thing about pattern matching is that you have to recognize them before you can exploit them. Black letter fonts all over the place for, uh, for newspapers. I don't actually know why they choose these fonts. I think they think that they're authoritarian and they have a certain cachet to them. They look super ancient. Um, but if you put them on the back of a pair of sweatpants, <laughs> you've suddenly subverted all of that, which is actually kind of cool. I have to give them respect for taking something that is only associated with highbrow journalism and then putting it on people's butts. And of course, Helvetica, or Helvetica Neue, which is the system font for retina displays. Um, this is kind of uh, the elephant in the room. If you're going to diverge from Helvetica in your application, not only do you want to do it for reasons that are good to you and maybe good to your audience, but you have to really pay attention to the technical problems of switching away from Helvetica, because the entire OS was designed around Helvetica. It wasn't designed for Helvetica, but it kind of gets it as a side effect. All these, well, the UI navigation bar there is 44 points tall. And it's 44 points tall because, well, largely because of the touch sizing, but also because of the font size that they wanted to use to make it look legible on the original iPhone. Now, one of the realities of fonts is that the letters all live on a baseline. Lowercase letters reach a certain height that is called the X height. It's called X just because it's lowercase x. Um, uppercase letters hit, uh, that is a cap height, but also any letters that have bits that jut up called ascenders, like the L, a D. The T on this has a really short uh, ascender, but generally speaking, they go to what is called the ascender line. In Helvetica and Helvetica Neue, it's just kind of a coincidence that the, that the cap height is the same as the ascender line. And then there are letters that go below the line, and these are the descenders. And descenders go down to the descender line. And so these metrics are what define the font. And the ratio of the x height to the cap height is more or less what defines the perceived size of the font and the readability thereof. So for an entire operating system designed around Helvetica, designed around these metrics and this stroke weight, if you start just swapping stuff out willy-nilly, you might get yourself in trouble. This is Zapfino, and this is Zapfino in exactly the same point size as that previous Helvetica. This is 20-point Helvetica Neue bold. This is 20-point Zapfino. And the X height is actually pretty much the same, but the cap height and the ascenders and descenders are out of control. And as far as I know, you can't do this. You can't just have letters busting out of your nav bar into the main view of the app and into the status bar. So you can start trying to mess around with this, make it smaller so that it fits, and this goes down to uh, 13 points, Zapfino. But at this point, just to get it to fit, the strokes are so anemic and the, everything is so small that the title of your application is now losing a battle against the time just because you wanted like, something a little more elegant than Helvetica. And so the metrics really, really play a big part in how your app design works. 
if you were going to use Zapfino on the whole, I'd recommend just increasing the size of everything in your app. Instead of 44 pixel table cells, bump it up to 60 or 70 to make it readable. But there are some things that are not really negotiable. The navigation bar in your iOS app is not that much negotiable. If we switch out Zapfino for something like Brush Script, which Brush Script isn't included in iOS, incidentally, so you'd have to embed it yourself, you'd have to license it. Uh, this is 20 point Brush Script. This time, Brush Script is a much more compact font. So even though it's the same point size, when you, det when you say the point size in your uh, code to say 20, the X height is like half that of Helvetica. The stroke width is, you know, more or less the same, so it's, it's, uh, it's not losing a battle. But the, the cap height is way smaller, the ascenders are way smaller, the descenders are, are pretty much on par. So in this case, to make everything seem roughly the same size, and bearing in mind, your app lives in an environment of other apps. So if your nav bar, the text is just way smaller than everyone else's app, people will think that you're doing it wrong. So if you just do the math, and you, know, you can figure out this ratio, like what is the ratio of the X height to the cap height in Helvetica, and then multiply that out on your font, uh, so for Brush Script, it ends up being 30 points. So anywhere in your UI that you're using Brush Script, you just do a 1.5 multiplier on the, the size of your font to make it look better, or to make it look like it's actually the right size. So in your back buttons, where that's normally 12-point Helvetica, you'd end up doing 18-point Helvetica. And if you do that throughout your application, you get a little more consistency and keep the readability up. So you have this legacy of Helvetica. And there are plenty of reasons to think twice about doing uh, custom typography, even in normal apps where it's, you know, uh, you don't do that much reading in applications. They're not, uh, UI is not made for long stretches of reading. But if you really wanted to customize your app, several good reasons to do it, your brand, and if it's, even if it is just your navigation bar in your cho choice of font, it really gives the app your character and the thing that you want to convey, and the rest of the app is in Helvetica, that'd be totally possible. But if you're making a game, for instance, you might really want to uh, give it a certain feeling. And Letterpress, which I play way too much of, has mostly round UI elements. All of the icons, the, uh, the current player indicator, everything is really nice and round and friendly. And as a result, well, not as a result, uh, as part of this decision, the developer Lauren Brichter has chosen a typeface that is much rounder and much friendlier than Helvetica. If you switched it out for Helvetica, everything would get way sharper and way less friendly. So it's your choice of font really impacts how you are perceived. And going into that for games, which are supposed to be friendly and fun, you might want to go down that route. Another upside to uh, to going custom fonts, and this is kind of going going ham on the custom fonts thing, is fonts are actually just a very neat way of putting multiple vector graphics into a compact file format that is cross-platform and easily accessible. So this is a font that I made when I was working at Square. It's called Square Micker. Micker stands for Magnetic Ink Character Recognition. In the old days, on the bottom of your, in the current days, on the bottom of your check, those numbers in the crazy font are actually printed in ferrous ink so that when they run it through a check reader, it's reading it with a magnetic ink uh, character recognizer so that you know, there's no transcription errors. And so it's the w there's the weirdest fonts in the world. And for the purposes of Square, uh, where I just wanted to use this on the one page in the entire app where you have to, recognize, or you have to reference your own checks to you know, connect your bank account, um, just wanted to demonstrate that with the appropriate font. Uh, licensing one of these fonts is really expensive because the only people who make these micro fonts are people who are selling them to banks. So we weren't going to license the font. And also, it's like 12 characters. It's, you know, it's 10 digits and four control characters, so it's 14 characters. Bad at math. Um, and not that hard to make. There are plenty of uh, font making tools on the App Store. If you can uh, get a designer or if you yourself can work in vectors, you can just copy and paste your vectors into a font tool and make your own font. It's really not that difficult in these constrained cases. I would never recommend making a typeface. I've done it. It's kind of hellish. Um, but 
the convenience of a font as a, me a means of transporting vector graphics is you can just throw anything in there. Throw in the company logo because when the developers need to put the logo on a page of the app, they can either ask the designers for an asset that's cut up like a ping or a JPEG and then make two assets because we have to deal with 2x for iPhone and then make three different resolutions for Android or they can just use the font and hit shift S to print out a perfectly reproduced, massively scalable company logo. So maybe the biggest reason to go, to go ham on, uh, on custom fonts, and also a lot of this is what James will be talking about immediately after me, is really tight control over how your text appears in your application. If you're a reading application where your number one point for existing is to have words on the screen, this is important. Uh, if you wrote up Moby Dick in Microsoft Word and then just copied and pasted it into iBooks, this is how crummy it might look. This is just left aligned Helvetica. If you felt like it, you could uh, spice it up, go to Georgia. Georgia's not that exciting a font. It's one of those web fonts that I talked about earlier. It's been around for a long time, but at least it has a little more character than Helvetica, especially if as an iPad or an iPhone user, you're seeing Helvetica all day, every day. Um, and reading it for long stretches is never really its intention. So a nice, comfortable uh, serif font like Georgia, but still, uh, we might want to fully justify align it to make it f look like it fills the page rather than that like left-heavy, lopsided left alignment. Of course, that causes problems where you get these contiguous uh, gaps because when you fully justify text, you're just stretching the text over the whole line to give it the impression of filling the line. Um, so it creates uneven gaps. These are some gigantic gaps and some tighter gaps, but when you get contiguous ones lining up on multiple lines, you get these huge things that we call rivers. And there's only really one or two of them on this page, but on a bad page of text or especially narrow columns, like you see in uh, newspapers and magazines, it can be really distracting. So a way around this is hyphenation. Now there are probably some really horrifyingly sophisticated hyph hyphenation algorithms in the world, but if you bust up words, and this is obviously language dependent as well, then you can give the impression of even spacing between all the letters while also um, making sure that you're not creating rivers and not disturbing the flow of reading. From there, we can just keep playing around. We can just uh, give some more love to this text. We just indent the start of the paragraph. We'll open up the spacing on the lines. Um, this is called leading, by the way. In the old days when type was actually made of metal, if you wanted to increase the gaps between these chunks of metal, you just put some lead in there. So by default, Georgia's uh, leading is like one-fifth of the line height. If we open it up to a third, it gives all the text a little more breathing room. If you're going to be reading Moby Dick for hours and hours and hours, it may as well be a comfortable experience. If we uh, swap out some typographically incorrect um, punctuation, these two dashes here, just for some end dashes, Fonts throughout the world have a lot of rich punctuation. And that screenshot I showed you earlier of the square font was from a, an app that is on the App Store called um, Ultra Character Map. And it'll let you like really dive in to the font and see what's there that you won't get by mashing your keyboard. So like any curly quotes, special dashes, you can use an actual ellipsis instead of just using three periods. You can use an actual registered trademark sign instead of just putting an R between two parentheses. Um, another one, if you dig around in the font, there are these things called ligatures. They're when multiple characters are special cased because they appear together frequently. Here, the, uh, the bars on these Fs are touching, and the end of the F is meeting up with the dot on the I, and they're just kind of bunched together. So there's a special case where they created a character just for that. It's the FFI ligature, and it just makes it look much neater. And if you can go through all your text and automatically substitute some of those things, then, then wonderful. And we'll like open up the tracking on the title there just to make it a little more imposing. And one final thing, just add a little flourish there instead of a line. And that's, that's actually just a character from a font called Bodoni Ornaments, which is installed on your iPhone. And so with what looks like five minutes of effort, but is actually probably hours and maybe even weeks of developer time, you can make some text that looked like nobody gave a damn and make it beautiful. And 
if anything at all is true of, of app design, it's that you're trying to make it look like you gave a damn so that people will pay you money for it. So spending some time on some text can actually pay off. But the big, the big win for typography and for looking into this at all is that it's an ancient, ancient practice. There are so many generations of people who have come before you who have tried and failed and tried and succeeded. You can just pick up a book and read any number of things about typography that have been true and tested for hundreds of years. So in a few days of reading, you can get up to speed on what is a pretty tested uh, design practice and using the tools that you already use every day. You don't have to learn Photoshop. You don't have to learn a 3D tool. You don't have to learn a motion graphics tool. You can start making your designs and your applications look better just using the tools that you're already using every day. And on that note, I'll turn it over to James Dempsey, who is going to talk to you about the tools you're using every day. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is James Dempsey. Um, as Bill mentioned briefly, I am ex-Apple. I worked at Apple for 15 years doing a variety of jobs, starting in evangelism, moving to technical training, and then finally spending the bulk of the time in software engineering, working on both applications, OS X, and a little bitty bit of time on iOS as well. Um, then I went indie, and I am currently working small Shop, top of software, I make apps. Today we're going to talk about beautiful text. And before we jump into the technical decision making or steps that we might take in terms of bringing beautiful text to your apps, I just wanted to take a moment to uh, share with you a quotation from the elements of typographic style, which I think really sums up what it is we're trying to accomplish. So well-chosen words deserve well-chosen letters. These in their turn deserve to be set with affection, intelligence, knowledge, and skill. So no pressure there. <laughs> but really, it is the content of your applications that provide those well-chosen words. And as Clarko just described to us, the font that you select those glyphs in the font provide those well-chosen letters. And then the rest of this presentation is really talking about the different approaches you might take and pros and cons thereof of setting that text, taking the vision of your designer and setting it in your app and presenting it with that affection, intelligence, knowledge, and skill. And so what is our choices, what are the approaches we can take to present text to the user. So on the one hand, we have the classes in UIKit which are designed to present text. There's the UI text view for multiple lines of text that we're able to edit or we can turn off editability and select and do things with the text. There's UI label, which also presents text, but it's designed for static text that we're really not expecting the user to interact with very much. And a UI text field for handling input of single lines of text. And so we could just pull those in from Interface Builder, wire them up, set some text in them, and away we go. Or we could write a custom text view, subclass UI view, and do our own drawing of the text. And we would take one of two approaches. We could use string drawing, where we take, take a string and in our drawing code say, take this string, use this font, draw it at this location, go. Or we could use a framework called core text, which does extremely nice line layout, layout of text with advanced typographic features, typographic, typographic features. Um, so the trade-off between these two is really the crux of what we're talking about today. 
How do we deliver that beautiful text? So some factors to consider as we think about these trade-offs. The first is the typographic flexibility. Am I able to present what I want to express typographically? And some things to think about there would be, can I use multiple fonts and colors? Can I adjust things about the paragraph itself, line spacing, indentation, hyphenation? Um, and other advanced typographic features, uh, Clarko mentioned ligatures, kerning, or the spacing between letters would be another one of those. But the other thing that it's important to remember is, yes, we want that text to look beautiful, but we're not just, we're not making a book. We're not printing things on a page. Users expect to interact with the text. So usability of that text is also important to remember when you're choosing the approach that you take. And by this I mean possibly you'll want the user to edit the text, but even in an e-reading app, the user is going to expect to select the text. They might want to copy passages, tweet them to their friends, select a word and look, up, look it up in a dictionary, um, highlight some text. And then another thing that's very important when you're thinking about text is the accessibility. The text in your apps should be accessible so that blind users are able to use VoiceOver, an awesome feature in iOS, to be able to have that text read to them. And this is particularly important if you are planning on selling your applications into government and education accounts because accessibility is required in those apps by law. And so with all these features, the other thing to consider is the engineering time. Because with great power usually comes lots of code. <laughs> and so that's going to affect your time to market. That's going to affect the complexity of your project. That's going to affect maintainability. Because if you had written a custom text field or text view when iOS first shipped, None of the text fields supported copy, paste, or voiceover, or any of these things. But as iOS progressed, the amount of functionality in those standard text widgets increased. So you're kind of signing up that you're always going to be improving your custom text view as you go. So let's make a little scorecard of what we might do. I have three options here. Custom basic. Maybe you're doing some string drawing, but you haven't thought so much about the usability sort of things. So there you can get you know, medium to extremely high level. You can specify exactly where you want everything. But if you haven't thought too much about the usability or spent the time to do it, that's kind of low by default. You have to expend the effort. And in the end, it's you know, a moderate amount of engineering effort. If you want to do a nice, really full-featured custom text view, you get to put everything exactly where you want. You get to interact with it exactly the way you want the user to interact. And you also get to write every line of code and maintain it, which is fine, especially if that is the core thing that your application is doing. But let's look at the built-in stuff. So the engineering effort there is, it's hard to imagine a lower effort. Somebody's already written this class for you. You drag it in. You set the text on it. You're done. The usability is high. Those are the classes that tend to set the standard for what users are expecting text to do in the operating system. So then it comes down to how much flexibility do I have with the typography? And that really is the crux on iOS of the question of which way do I go? And in iOS 6, any calculus you may have been doing in these trade-offs has changed significantly. And let's talk about that. Well, first, let's revisit this quotation. And then let's say I'm on iOS 5 or earlier, and I want to just put this on the screen in a UI label. Well, I'd get something like this. 
because with a UI label, I can set pick one and only one font for the entire string of text. I can't adjust the line spacing. If I wanted to have some italic in there, no, I'd get all italic. If I wanted a little bit of an accent color on something, no, I'd get, you know, all color. I, one choice. And so the most flexibility I have is maybe playing around with which font I'm going to use to display this quotation. And none of these are particularly satisfying. So for the longest time on iOS, we'd have to fill this in with a resounding low, disappointing. Ah, oh, so close. But no, I got to go to column three, because I don't want to write a crappy text view. I want to write a nice text view. Ah, oh, that'll slip the schedule or extend the schedule. iOS 6, same UI label, same project of code, but now I can set and adjust rich text there. So, hey, let's add some different typefaces and add a little emphasis in the quotation. Maybe we'll adjust the paragraph spacing. Excuse me. Let's change the font size there at the bottom to de-emphasize who we're getting the quote from. We'll add some paragraph spacing. Maybe we'll increase the letting and maybe down here we'll tighten the letting up a little bit. Maybe we want to hang the punctuation, so we'll use some indentation so the, the starting quotation mark is hanging off the side instead of being part of the uh, block of text. Maybe we will add a little color there to both de-emphasize but also highlight who has given us this quotation. And so in iOS 6, we have this. Prior to iOS 6 with a UI label, we had that. But now we can have this. That is a dramatic change in our equation of these trade-offs. So engineering effort remains really low in iOS 6 for the things that are built in. The usability is just as high but now the typography, whoops, I will give it a medium to high, B plus, A minus. We might not be able to do every little thing that we want to do, but good Lord, it's better. Um, you could certainly see why prior to iOS 6, a lot of people doing custom text views, because a lot of things could not be done. Now many, many, many things can be done very easily. And so if there's one takeaway from this part of the talk is, or this section of beautiful text is, take a look at the new stuff in iOS 6. Now how do we specify this stuff? As a matter of fact, the only thing engineering that has changed between those two examples is specifying the rich text to be displayed. And this is done using an object called an attributed string. And an attributed string, very easily, is a string of text. And then associated with that string of text, each character conceptually has a dictionary or grouping of key value pairs describing the style information. So in this case, which is a good example of why they don't let engineers near the des do the design, um, we got the ransom note style here. Um, we have the H is Helvetica bold, 144 point yellow, and it's specifying that character, and then another font being used, another color being used. Fairly easy conceptually, although we don't usually use ransom note style. Typically, it's a range of text that has associated with it a set of style information. And I this morning I looked at it like, why did I pick such a morbid quotation, for God's sake? It's because of the ligatures in shuffle and off, to be honest, and the kerning in two. Now, how do we do this in code? Even if you're not a coder, it's not conceptually too difficult. So at the beginning, we take the string that we want to use. We ask the system for the font we want to use. We 
create an object of the color we want to use, we stick those into a dictionary of key value pairs. The font should be the font object. The foreground color should be our color. I've added a couple of additional uh, keys here to turn on ligatures and kerning, which are nice features. Then once I have my dictionary of attributes, I just say, hey, make me an attributed string using this string and these attributes. Then UI label and all the other text classes have a new attributed string property. I set that attributed string on the label, and I get something like this. Now notice that I've using, used, using, used a mutable attributed string, which means that I can change it programmatically. We'll take that same string and let's add another style. In this case, a bold version of the font, a red color. I make another dictionary with these key value pairs. I need the range of text I'm going to apply these styles to. And then I just add these attributes for this range of characters. And then again, set it on the UI label. And I would get something of this nature. So it's pretty straightforward to do. Now let's take a look at that, what we had before, UI label. And as I mentioned, UI label is what you use when you don't expect the user to be interacting with the text. So really, if we wanted the user to be able to look up these words or select and tweet, we would really want of the built-in classes to use an uneditable UI text view. And you might notice, going back and forth between the two, actually this will show it a little better, there's a UI label, there's a UI text view. Label, text view, label, text view, label, text view. You see the text is jumping around a little bit. What's going on there? And this drove me a little crazy. The top is showing you, of each of these, is showing you what UI label is going to render by default. The text view, is, the second line is what a text view is rendering. You'll notice that in the UI label, I'm getting my lovely ligatures. Those two, the double Fs and the FFL, it's all rendered as one glyph, typographically beautiful. The text view, not so much. What's going on here? Especially that FFL and shuffle looks pretty crappy compared to the, the top one. And also the default kerning, how the characters are paired. UI label, you'll notice the O and the Y, they both get tucked under that capital T so nicely. It's all cozy. The UI text view, not so much also, especially glaring in that T-O. So what's going on here? Why do we have this difference? I, it's the exact same attributed string I'm setting on both. It's an iOS 6 pitfall. And to understand why, we just need to do highlights of history in iOS text development. So in iOS 2, actually since the inception, text views, table field, uh, text fields, labels, and web views, all were using WebKit to render their text. Um, then with the introduction of the iPad and iOS 3.2, there's a new framework in town, Core Text, which provides those advanced typographic features like ligatures and kerning. And Core Text also introduced attributed strings. But at that point, you would need to write a custom view to take advantage of core text. And is it a coincidence that core text showed up around the same time as iBooks? Probably not. But then in iOS 6, I'm able to specify an attributed string as the contents of all of those classes. And in addition, two out of the three moved over to render, use core text to do its drawing. Whereas text view is still using WebKit. And that's why we end up getting a different result with the same attributed string in iOS 6. 
So the question you have to ask yourself is, do you feel love? No, that's not it. <laughs> How much do those ligatures and kerning mean to you? Now, to wrap up, let's talk about, well, not to wrap up, but the next piece I'd like to say is that there are sometimes, although now I think hopefully it's plain to see that the number of cases where you need to write a custom text view have greatly diminished in iOS 6. But there are still times when you would want to write a custom text view or use custom text. Now, one of those would be if you're combining views for performance. Now, if you have a table view and that table view, each cell has many, many different views in it, sometimes that can affect your scrolling performance. And one way to alleviate that is instead of having lots of different views drawing, you create one master, one view that draws all of the elements at once. In which case, in this case, you might draw, you might use UI string drawing just to draw those elements. If you do, don't forget the UI accessibility so that blind users are able to actually use your table also. Another thing that you might want to drop down, in this case, to Cortex to do is if you're doing, if you need greater layout control, if you're writing something like pages where you want the text to wrap nicely around, say, a circular shape. Um, in this case, core text is your friend. It allows for uh, to set paths around which text will be laid out. You'll want to look at the UI text input protocol so your custom view will interact with the keyboard and always UI accessibility. And then sometimes the text that you want to render is a very specialized use. You might be working on, say, an equation editor in which case you really want precise control over where each one of those glyphs is laid out. And you probably want to do it in your own very particular way. Core text allows you to specify and adjust where everything is laid out. Also in this case, you would probably have a particular interaction model that is different or goes beyond kind of the standard text model. And so regardless of which way you go, either you taking advantage of the greatly enhanced capabilities up at UIKit or dropping down for hopefully less and less or fewer and fewer reasons, you can achieve beautiful text in your apps. Here are some resources. Uh, I love these WWDC sessions. If you're new to attributed strings or even if you're not, those two sessions are excellent. Um, Core text and fonts if you want to drop down. And if you are writing a custom text view, keyboard input in iOS is important even if you're not doing one that needs select, it, it, excuse me, even if you don't need the user to edit, there's a section in there about selecting text and getting, interacting with the system selection mechanism that is crucial if you're trying to write a, uh, custom text view. And with that, I thank you very much.